So anyway, it's good to be here. Good to see you all. And as Basil said, relationships are eternal. Yeah. And we are very, very much grateful to the Lord for the time that we've been able to work together, preach the gospel together, all the things that we have, God has done in our hearts together. Amen. Banged heads together. Come out on the other side and loved each other more. But here we are, and we know what it means to stand together for the gospel. And it's a privilege. It's a big, big privilege. Amen. So last weekend, we were in Gaborone, and we had our young adults camp, and we had an amazing time. 160 young adults came from, not youth, young adults. They came from Zimbabwe, uh, mainly from Zimbabwe and from Botswana. And we had a small group come from the other churches, Durban and Cape Town and places like that. These young people are going to be the backbone of our church in the future. And we really, really had a, an amazing weekend. Hearts were ignited. And they are ready to stand in the front lines and work with us and take the gospel forward. I was encouraged. Very encouraged. Amen. So, yeah, it's exciting. I'm going to, I'd like to share this morning um, something that I shared two weeks ago in Bulawayo. It was a meeting we took there and It is something God put upon my heart to scriptures I look back over our lives. And I think that's what shook me the most. I realized all the mistakes that we had made and how God has not overlooked them, he's used them. And now we are stronger today than we were before. And I really want to share the heart of God for you today, each one of us, collectively as a church, but individually as well. So let's turn in in our Bibles to Isaiah 55. And we're going to read verses 8 and 9. And then we'll wander down. Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and nor are your ways my ways says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Although God was speaking primarily to the nation of Israel about the coming of the Messiah and the prophecies to be fulfilled, etc., the concept he's speaking here applies to each one individually. Because God doesn't change, and his ways are higher than our ways. And we must understand that. I want to come down now to verse 10 and verse 11. He speaks about the rain that comes down and the snow and waters the earth and brings it forth. It's verse 11. And so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but will accomplish that which I please and shall prosper in the thing to which I sent it. That verse is often taken out of context. I understand that where men take the scriptures and say, God said his word and therefore he has to make it prosper. It is not us that takes the word of God and manipulates it. God is saying, I have spoken my word and God is sovereign. And this scripture is speaking of his sovereignty. When I have made a plan, he says, I will bring it to pass. When I have spoken, it will happen. And there's something very solid behind what we have just read here. Okay? So, what about our mistakes? What about how God because we are human and we sometimes, we sometimes know what God wants from us but we run ahead of ourselves and we fall on our nose and God picks us up but his word never changes and his ways never change 
And sometimes we put a cross on our lives because we say, I failed. But there's no failure in God. He only uses those circumstances to deal with our character and prepare us for what he promised he was going to do. So let's have a look at some of, the, of these characters in the Bible. Okay. Let's go to our first friend, and that is Mr. Moses in Hebrews chapter 11. There are some classics in the Bible, I can promise you. If you want to see how to fail, just read about the guys in the Bible. They got it right all the time. Hebrews 11, and it speaks of Moses here in verse 24. So it says, When Moses, when he was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked for the reward. However, verse 26 was added on after his experience, because when he messed up, he wasn't thinking like that. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's court by his mother. And so she made it very clear to him that God, he was different, and God had a plan for him, very clear. So though he was a prince, he was a Hebrew, and he understood that God is going to use me to help my people. That was clear in his heart. He just looked for the opportunity. So when he saw this Egyptian abusing a Hebrew, what did he do? He intervened. And now we have a very dead Egyptian. And Moses suddenly realized that he was a very insignificant feature in Pharaoh's kingdom after he had killed an Egyptian. So he ran for his life. And that destroyed the plan of God, right? So God had raised up Moses to deliver the people. He kills the Egyptian and he's hiding in the desert chasing sheep. Did God's word change? No. Did God's plan change? No. Not at all. So for 40 years, until he has lost all self-confidence, Moses is running around the desert. But in the fullness of times, he meets the burning bush. And in the fullness of times, God takes a broken man, not a proud man. He takes a humble man, not an arrogant man. And he turns Moses' mistakes for his glory. And he sends him back to Egypt. And the word that he spoke was going to happen. And we know the story. He led the people out. He led them out in God's time, not in Moses' time. Moses failed. God turned it around. And he used it for his purposes. And so the story continues. Come with me. Well, I'll just talk about Joseph in, Ge in Genesis chapter 37. The boy with the coat of many colors. We read it. He's the last born. His dad loves him. His brothers not, don't like him. He has this fancy little garment that tells them he's the favorite. They just despise him even more. Then he has some dreams. And in the dreams, he sees his brothers bowing down to him, meaning, one day I'll be in charge. Then he sees the sun and the moon and all the stars bowing down to him, meaning one day I'm going to have authority over my parents. And so, what does he do? He goes and chirps. He goes and tells the family that the he brothers, one day you guys are going to bow down to me. Now, don't forget, in culture, the youngest never did that. And then he goes and says, well, even my mom and dad, they're going to bow down to me. You can imagine, you put yourself in the context. He was arrogant. I mean, this little chirpy guy is walking around like, I'm going to be the boss one day. Well, they sorted him out. He found himself as a slave, minus his coat, minus his dreams. Now he's sold to Potiphar. Now he's in jail. Years and years and years. Do you think in his mind he failed? In his heart, he knew God gave me a dream and God gave me a purpose. God gave me a plan. I know what God told me. I'm in jail. 
I have blown it completely. In terms of success, zero. In terms of humility, 100%. God took him and broke him and broke him and broke him until finally, in one day, he became the prime minister of Egypt. And finally, the word that God spoke came to pass. And God said, that which I have sent will bring forth fruit. And you know the story. The brothers came and they bowed down. The old folks were still alive and they came and they bowed down. Just as he had seen. It was just, I don't know, 40 years later, whatever it was, it happened. God took his, his failure was not his defeat. It was simply God's opportunity to work in his character. Very often when we fail, it's exactly what God wants. He's waiting for us to make a mistake so that we can learn a bit of humility, so that he's able to use us for what he really wants. It makes sense, doesn't it? It's just as jolly painful at the time, isn't it? So let's move along. David and the Ark of the Covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 6. The Ark has been... He's just come to power and he wants to do right. So they go to the Philistine territory and they go and fetch the Ark. And they put it on an ox cart. And they're coming back down the road on the ox cart. And David and his boys are celebrating and screaming and shouting and having a great day. And Uzzah puts his hand out to stabilize the thing and dies. And now it's, David is mortified. So he has to leave the ox cart in the house of Obed-Edom. And he failed in the eyes of the nation. He failed. He comes home. The celebration is over. Everybody in the country is morbid. They're quiet. The ark hasn't come home. You can just imagine him walking into Jerusalem like, God just judged me. He judged us. Because they didn't do it God's way. You understand that? So God said, you don't do it that way. You do it my way. I'm not putting up with your scrap. And down came lightning and the guy dies. Now, in the eyes of the whole country, David is a failure. The king had this great idea. It came to nothing. And for the next three months, he thought about it. And then he understood. God has a way. And they went and got the priests. And they put the, the poles on the shoulders of the priests. And they brought it back. God's way. David failed. But then it was restored. In all these things, God never gives up. He just corrects us. And he works in us. Okay? Now, I want you to come to Galatians chapter 2. We'll come closer to the... Um, this time we're going to come back into the New Testament. The story of our friend Peter. Where are we going? Have you ever had chapters move in your Bible? They do in mine. Here we are. Galatians chapter 2, and let's have a look at verse 7. Paul is writing about the work that God called Peter to do and God called him to do. He says, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcision had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcision was to Peter. So in Jerusalem, when they met, it was very clear Paul was to take the gospel and go and preach to the Gentiles. And Peter would be spend his time working with Jewish converts around the Israel and Palestine and the Middle East then. So Peter saw himself as the apostle to the Jews, and Paul was to go further afield. And so we have a little church in a town called Galatia. Jews and Gentiles are together. Happy family. Along comes Brother Peter. And what does Brother Peter do? He says, we can't have everybody eat together because Jews are different to Gentiles. And he, so he starts to separate the Jewish Christians from the Gentile Christians and creates a social divide and chaos. Paul arrives, and what's happening? The church is all over the place. Why? Because Brother Peter is talking only to the Jews and these inferior Gentiles he's not associating with. 
So Brother Paul stands up in church and publicly puts Peter in his place. This is the apostle that was with Jesus and up on the mountain and all the rest. He says, excuse me, my friend, let me help you. You've made a great big mess here. We're going to correct this thing and put it back in order. And Peter is sitting on the front row. How did he feel? He felt about that size, correct? I mean, he, he couldn't stand up and say, oh, wait, 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 I'm the guy who's been with Jesus. You know, I'm the great man of God here. He understood something. He'd crossed the line and he'd made a big mistake. And God was correcting him. Even at that point of maturity, he crossed the line and made a mistake. He got corrected. He, he had to humble himself and admit, guys, I'm wrong. And the church was healed. Later on, he writes to, and he says, you guys, I want to encourage you to listen to our brother Paul, who has many wonderful things to say. Ah, <laughs> especially about me. Ah, <laughs> but he understood. You can see the relationship between the two men was healed. It was brought together. But Peter's mistake and his failure, God did not put a cross on Peter. He only worked in his character and then released him to go back and do better things. Can you see the pattern? All these guys fail. Abraham and Ishmael. If you read the scriptures, God speaks very clearly to Abraham and says to him, from your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. I'm going to, from you, we're going to raise up a tribe and the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And Abraham believed God, it says, and God counted him for righteousness. And his wife knew that. And time passes on. And then Sarah comes to him and says, I, we need to talk about something here. Because we know what the plan of God is. It's just that uh, we're getting old. And God isn't coming to the party. So we need to help God. So here's my maid, Hagar, and I want you to marry her. It literally says she gave her to Abraham as a wife. So you can have a child by Hagar so that we can help God. Well, you know the, the answers to that one, don't you? Along comes Ishmael, and God came along, what it was, 20 years later, and said to Abraham, now that you're so old, you can't have a kid. I'm going to give you one. Like I said I would. And by the way, Ishmael disappears. And Ishmael hasn't disappeared properly. He's running around the Middle East throwing bombs at people right now. But anyway. <laughs> God took Abraham's complete mistake. He didn't put a cross on Abraham. He just waited until the time was right and said, I spoke my word. I gave it with his mom. And Isaac was raised up to be chapter 21, it says, at the set time, God came to Abraham and said, now is the time you're going to have a child. And in, in each one of us, in our journey with the Lord, there are things that God puts in our hearts that we, it's, that we know God has given us, what can I say, a desire to serve Him. But often, in our lack or our immaturity, whatever it is, we run ahead of ourselves or we blow it. Does that mean that he's finished with us? Not at all. It's simply to do what he wants us to do. So I'm going to give you just a few little stories. And this is what got me thinking. Back in 1980, we got independence in Zimbabwe, and I really felt we needed to start a Christian education system in our nation because we had no idea if we we're going to go communist or not. And so I got the rights to a program called Alpha and Omega. And we started printing Alpha and Omega. And it's a homeschooling program. And then we started a school in Bulawayo and we had a, a um, little warehouse in Harare and we started a school in Harare and other schools. We were 
pushing out for an Amiga. I didn't do my due diligence. We employed the wrong people as headmasters and staff. We didn't understand. We we're just running around. And then when we started to work with Brother Mickey, <clears throat> he called me aside one day and he said, it's either going to be the school or the ministry, but you can't do both. And I realized that we were, I had taken my life on a tangent to do something that was right, but not maybe right with God. And we had to go back and I had to call the board in and say, I am uh, going to resign. So what happened was Alfred and Amiga collapsed <coughs> along with my pride. And in fact, the Petra schools in Bulova very kindly took our students on as an annex. So now you've got the whole town knowing that your school failed and they've, another school has adopted your students to get you out of trouble. And, and so, how can I put it? My success at education had failed completely. About that time, so then that's, we failed there and everyone's looking at us like, okay. And I, made, I almost made God a promise. I said, I don't ever want to get involved in Christian schools education again. Huh. If you come to Bulawa, we now have our own private school, by the way. And we are probably the only proper Christian school in town and numbered among the three top private schools in town. In the right time, God created a school. And now the school is running and it's running properly. And I look at it and I wonder how it happened because how can I put it? In the time that I tried to make it happen, it failed. In the time that God chose it to happen, it prospered. And in between that, we had to swallow a lot of bricks. Amen. And so, what did we do? Basil was with us. We, created, we started Bulawa Christian Center. And to every young pastor in town, we were the hottest thing in town. We had a building with four stories. We had music ministries, youth ministries, Bible schools going, newspapers going. Everybody wanted to copy Bulawa Christian Center. It's only that it was built on a humanistic foundation and not on the work of the cross. Inside we had drama, but we were still building this church called Bulawa Christian Center. And one day <clears throat> it became very clear to us that we are building our church on the wrong foundation. And so we decided to embrace the gospel that we embrace now. What we prayed and we said, Lord, whatever man has built here, you know, why don't you take it apart? We thought there'd be a few. We lost every single thing. We were literally on the street. And we were now sweeping out beer bottles from some Hindu hall to start church on a Sunday. And we went from 1,100 people at a celebration to 300 in six weeks. And the whole town was laughing at us. When you are one of those pinnacle, we had 50 home cells at one stage. When you're at the pinnacle there, and six weeks later, you are, you are on your way to Egypt as a slave, as it were. And all the pastors are saying, what happened? And they're telling the people not to come to your church anymore. Well, there wasn't a church anymore. Do you know what happens is you just step back and you think, my whole life ended. Everything we put into the church has gone. And we started again. But out of that, we have what we have today. Today, we have a team of men. We have a network of churches on the right foundation. And God took our mistakes. He humbled us, taught us. And now, the same group of churches or people in town that said, Why did, what were you doing? Come and say, how do you do it? We now do leader seminars everywhere from our mistakes. But God had, had put something in our hearts years ago. We just got it wrong. While we had Christian Center in the early days, one of our desires, one of my desires, was to take the gospel 
to rural areas and help other pastors. And I had a very clear plan in my mind. One of them was to get an airplane, put motorbikes in an airplane, land on a remote landing strip somewhere, take the motorbikes with all our little trailers and go out into the bush and preach the gospel because we can fly in and fly out. It gives us quick access. And I always thought about that and thought, how can we do it? And then we had a guy come through who was obviously a prosperity preacher. And we were talking in my house and he said, that's a great idea. And that evening he stood up and he ambushed me because he put the vision to the church and got people to give for a project. I'm like, whoa, we just accelerated that thing forward quickly. Basil will remember. You remember the preacher too. And so I phoned the Air Force and I said, I'm looking for a Douglas DC-3 or C-47. And they had one for sale. And so I said, okay, let's talk. I want to buy it. Now we're getting our airplane. But it was a bit expensive to run. So I phoned Reynard Bonke because I knew him. He stayed with me. And I said, Reynard, look, when you go north, you need a big airplane to help move your essential goods, oils and things like that for your trucks and your tents. And if I have an airplane and we share it, I mean, what a team. We can do this. He came back and he said, mm, I think it will be a tortoise. I don't want it. What happened at the end of the day is the airplane crashed. And my pride crashed. And we had to eat humble pie because we had this great big vision that never happened. And so we, we're losing the school, we're losing the airplane, we're losing the church. Can you understand that we're losing a few things here? And we're losing badly. And we're losing, I'm losing my pride fast. Like I can't find it anymore. Do you know what we're doing today? We are now spending our life going around Africa talking to pastors. The very thing that we wanted to do then, we're doing now. It was just that we did it in our own strength. But our failure, God did not put a cross on us. He used the difference. And I look back, and if you ask me, we have more uh, things that we have attempted to do in, when we were young in the ministry and failed than we have successes. In fact, the whole lot, in many ways, was a disaster. But today, we, we are, the things we knew, we saw then, is what we are doing now. Planting the churches, reaching the leaders, building the schools. Just it's, but it's God going ahead of us. But God had, the word of God never changed. The plans of God never changed. Just that the vessels were full of scrap. And God had to put us through the fire a little bit before we were mature enough to do what he wanted us to do. So was the word in our heart? Yes, to be trying to run ahead of God like Sarah with Abraham? Oh, fast. You know, Peter and I, we created a, primarily him and I and a guy in Harari called Tom, we created an organization in Zimbabwe called AFCM, the Africa Fellowship of Christian Ministers. And it was our version of the uh, one in South Africa um, that was read by, run by Ed Robert. And every so many months, we would get all the young pastors in Zimbabwe from the evangelical churches into a conference, and we would teach them how to run the church. We, at 33 years old, were telling them how to fix their churches. Meantime, we needed a fire brigade back on our own, but that was fine. We were telling them how to run their churches. AFCM. Great stuff. When the gospel touched our hearts, we resigned, both of us, out of that thing, gone. But it caused drama because everywhere in the country we were seen as a failure. They actually prayed in Matari that we would leave the country, me in particular, because they thought we were damaging the nation. But AFCM became CTMI. CTMI is doing exactly what we were doing with AFCM. It's just that we try to build something ourselves. It's crazy, isn't it? If I look back and I think, well, okay, we're trying to get... In fact, at the time, you don't realize you build and it falls, you build and it falls. It's like you just keep on moving. But if I look back now, I just see that if we look preacher now, because I don't have a track record of success. We have a track record of broken 
buildings and houses and everything. Why? Because, I don't know, we ran ahead of God. But has God used that for his purposes? I would hope so. Today, we have faith for the kingdom, faith to build leaders, faith, we've learned a few things. Does it mean we get it right now? No. Will we still make mistakes? I think we could. And everything that, and even if we do, it's okay. God will take our mistakes again. Peter made one when he was a mature minister, and he still, God used him. God uses our mistakes. They hurt, but they, he uses them to confront us, to humble us, and then he uses them for his purposes. Does that make sense to you? I wanted to take this time to confess my sins to you because they are numerous. Huh? Thank you. I needed that. Because you're here today, and some of you put a cross on your lives. And you failed. You started off in your Christian life, and you've messed up. One way or another, you've messed up. And you have not got over the fact that you've messed up. In every single way, we can mess up. We can mess up in business. We can mess up in our marriages. We can mess up in a hundred different things. We've messed up. There's no such thing as a perfect Christian. We've messed up. Yes? And I think we start by start. And we say, all right, Lord, from that, what are you doing with this broken vessel? And God takes the broken vessel that's our life, and he makes something beautiful out of it. He needs the brokenness to make something beautiful. His plan for you has never changed. He's not given up on you. Not whether you're young or whether you're old. What? Basil's turning, you're turning 70 this year. Okay. So I'm just turned 70. We never thought that as old bullies we would be running around the globe preaching the gospel and serving the Lord. Back in those days, you were 70, gone for retirement, buddy, out of there. And yet, we have more doors, more opportunity, more responsibility than we did when we were 35. We had the energy then. Why? Because God doesn't need flesh. He needs humility. He needs a vessel that's cracked and broken. He needs men who walk with a limp. He needs a heart that has learned to, to bow its, its, itself in his presence. And it's only our mistakes that do that. We can say, Lord, I humble myself until he pulls the carpet and we realize that's what it means. And then out of the ashes of our failure, he makes something that is going to be precious. Amen. Amen. And I want to encourage you this morning because difficult days lie ahead for the world and for the Christian church. And there's much that goes on in Christianity that is going to be, find itself under pressure. Many churches are going to either go humanistic or collapse because there's going to come pressure for people to stand for truth. And God hasn't brought us together here just to be a small church in Durban. I spoke to, to Mickey at the conference because I've been, I just come out of, uh, we down, we've been in Guatemala and we come back through England and France and stuff. I said, you know, when I see these churches, I don't see them as smaller congregations in different countries. I see them as frontline churches for the gospel. And that's what we are. Who else will represent the gospel of Christ and Him crucified in this community except you? And how are we going to take it forward? And we, we represent it when the world watches our lives and watches how we work together. And the, Do you understand that? Storms come. The churches get shaken by storms. And the community wants to know, they watch. Because when it comes, a lot of congregations fall apart. COVID came. 
In Zimbabwe, majority of pastors who built a church around themselves closed their churches because they couldn't meet. And so they were the kingpin, and when they couldn't meet, they lost everything, including the offerings. And we, we had a feeding program for pastors in Bulawayo, and they all lined up to get their vegetables because they had no more congregations. We split into home groups and ran the thing in houses, and we came out with another 60 people after COVID. And they looked at us and said, how did you do it? I said, because it's not built on a man. It's built on a community. We are a body of people taking the gospel forward. And that gave us great witness in the community. Things that shake us, don't be afraid of them. They come. But they shake out, what can I say, the dust. But they unify the church. And we must be ready Shaking comes. That's okay. We must be ready to stand together, ready to build together, ready to realize that God spoke a word about this church. He's not changed his mind. What he said will happen. And we are a frontline church. We're on the front line of the gospel against all forms of humanism, all forms of wrong doctrine, all forms of, of religion that, that do not do Christ the glory. Don't look at your size and despise where well, we're small. This church can grow at any time. God is not worried about numbers. He's worried about what he has in his hand, the tools that he can use, and where he wants to go. And so we've got a great purpose here, just as we have a purpose everywhere for the churches. Does that make sense to you? Amen? And so your individual mistakes is not a place for failure. It's a place to say, okay, Lord, I repent, whatever it is, I move on. But as a church, we can go, we can go through the waves, up and down. And where are we? Here we are. Where are they? Gone. Amen. But that's given us credibility. It's given us stamina. It's built things into us that we are going to, God's going to use for the months and the years that can't lie down the road. And I, I want to leave that with you. I want you to lift up your eyes and realize, you know what? We're here, and God's busy. He hasn't forsaken us, and every one of us has a special place. And he has a plan for our lives, and we are going forward. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we want to thank you today for the privilege you chose, and yet they failed. And you picked it up, and you kept on going until your purposes were accomplished. Father, you, work, you always work with imperfect human vessels. It's our imperfections that give you the glory. It's our imperfections that shine your grace. It's our imperfections that enable you to build. And so, Father, take every heart and life here and rekindle, if it's necessary, the flames of faith in our hearts. Continue to unite us together. Bring our hearts together. That we will stand together for the purposes of Jesus Christ. For there are many lives that are yet to be impacted. People are going to become desperate and they need to see the living hope of what we have so father strengthen this church strengthen each individual may we lift up our heads and say thank you lord for your amazing grace upon my life and i am what i am today and i'm going to give you everything i have for tomorrow and so lord we give you the glory and the praise we thank you and we bless your name lord amen amen, amen.